On the 1st of July 2006, the Zimbabwean government released three men who were serving life sentences at the country's maximum security prison. The trio of Kevin Woods, Michael Smith, and Philip Conjuayo were convicted in 1988 for a car bombing targeting exiled members of South Africa's African National Congress, or ANC for short. The explosives detonated before reaching their target in the city of Bulawayo, killing the Zimbabwean driver they hired to deliver them. The three men had worked as intelligence officers in the Rhodesian government, but after independence in 1980, they were recruited by the South African Intelligence Service to carry out the apartheid government's operations in Zimbabwe. This incident is one of many episodes in a long story of how apartheid South Africa engaged in a decade-long campaign to destabilize its neighbors and the entire region of Southern Africa just to maintain its economic and political control of the region. During the colonial era, countries in the Southern Africa region developed a coast dependency on the South African economy and its transportation routes. The majority of the region's imports and exports flowed through South African ports. During the colonial era, this wasn't a problem. But as more countries in the region became independent, they became more reluctant to do business with South Africa's apartheid government. In 1980, a group of Southern African states met in Lusaka, Zambia to form the Southern African Development Coordinating Conference, or SADCC for short. Present at the meeting were the heads of state of Angola, Botswana, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Swaziland, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. The purpose of the SADCC was to increase cooperation between the countries and to minimize their economic dependency on apartheid South Africa. In the years that followed the formation of the SADCC, the apartheid government escalated its military and economic destabilization campaign. The motives for the campaign were not only economical, some of them were political. South Africa saw the campaign as an opportunity to limit the support which its neighboring states gave to internal liberation forces, like the ANC, SWAPO, and the PAC. But it also wanted to destroy the example that these newly independent countries would represent to the disenfranchised black majority of South Africa. The apartheid government's continued military and economic domination over the region, therefore, formed one of the cornerstones of apartheid. South Africa's destabilization of Southern Africa started five years before the formation of the SADCC. In 1975, thousands of South African troops invaded the recently independent nation of Angola from the south. The South African government wanted to stop whatever efforts Angola's new government did to support SWAPO freedom fighters in South Africa's territory of Namibia. Fearing that the South Africans would take over the country and install their puppet leader, the Angolan government called for military assistance from Cuba. The South Africans worked closely with UNITA, an Angolan militant group led by Jonas Savimbi. All strategic areas that were captured by South Africa were handed over to their ally UNITA. UNITA's leader Savimbi also had close links with the US. In January of 1986, Savimbi traveled to the United States. The attention given to Savimbi by the American administration and the media was greater than that given to any African head of state visiting the US. Savimbi's association with apartheid South Africa were not called into question, and he left America with Ronald Reagan's assurance for $15 million in military aid. Major invasions by South African troops continued in 1977 and 1981. It is said that in 1986, a large number of South African troops were occupying parts of southern Angola permanently. The apartheid government also supported another militant group, but this time it was in Mozambique. In the late 1970s, the Rhodesian government set up a militant organization called the Mozambican National Resistance, or RENAMO for short. RENAMO's purpose was to attack bases used by Zimbabwean freedom fighters in Mozambique. With independence in Zimbabwe, South Africa took over the stewardship of the armed bandits as they were called by the Mozambicans. From then on, RENAMO turned its focus to destabilizing Mozambique. Renamo would continually destroy vital rail and road links to Mozambican ports so as to divert traffic towards South African ports. They would also torture rural residents, steal their food, and destroy their crops, schools, and health clinics. In the 1980s, Renamo would conduct repeated attacks on the Zimbabwe Beira Railway and Pipeline and on oil storage facilities at Beira. The Zimbabwe Beira Railway and Pipeline were crucial supply lines for not just Zimbabwe but for other landlocked countries in the region. South Africa's army also conducted operations of its own in Mozambique. 
In May 1983, they conducted a bombing raid on the offices of the African National Congress in the Mozambican capital of Maputo, killing six people, only one of whom had any connections with the ANC. In October 1986, President Samora Machel of Mozambique was tragically killed in an air crash inside South Africa. South Africa claimed the crash was due to bad weather, but satellite photos showed a clear sky at the time of the crash. Prior to the crash, South Africa had threatened Michelle and Mozambique with an invasion, and many South African experts believe that South Africa simply carried out their threat. Although South Africa did not release any information about the crash, the belief among many experts is that it used false signal beacons to guide the plane off its intended course to Maputo and into South African territory. On December 10, 1982, a heavily armed force of about 100 South African commandos flew into the capital city of Lesotho, Maseru. The purpose of the mission? The South Africans said the attack was a strike against guerrillas attempting to overthrow their government. However, Lesotho's residents said that most of the victims were political refugees and not active insurgents. This surprise attack wasn't the last time Lesotho was involved with South Africa's commandos. Lesotho's geography is quite unusual as it is one of very few countries that are totally surrounded by another. It was this geographical quirk that the South Africans exploited in January 1986 when they shut their border with Lesotho. The disorder resulting from the lack of imports and exports led to a coup which many believed was engineered by South Africa, because immediately after the coup, the borders were reopened. As time went on, South Africans became more brazen with their attacks. And this was seen when, on the 20th of May 1986, South African troops and warplanes attacked alleged bases of the ANC in the capitals of Botswana, Zambia, and Zimbabwe, killing at least three people and wounding more than a dozen. The first attack took place shortly after midnight when South African commandos blew up the ANC's office in Harare, capital of Zimbabwe, and a suburban home linked to the guerrillas. At about 6.30 a.m., helicopter-borne assault troops attacked a housing complex outside Gaborone, Botswana, which South Africa said was used by ANC fighters. Helicopter gunships also stormed nearby Botswana army barracks. Then at 9 a.m., two warplanes bombed and shelled a United Nations refugee camp 16 kilometers southwest of Lusaka, Zambia. Apparently, the South Africans mistook it for a nearby compound used by the ANC. Lusaka was also where the ANC had its headquarters. Another dimension to South Africa's war against its neighbors was less well known. It was a subtle, cynical strategy of tinkering with ethnic tensions. A series of Zimbabwean court cases in the late 80s uncovered evidence of South African penetration at the highest reaches of Zimbabwe's intelligence agency. They suggest that South African agents, by manipulating intelligence reports and fanning ethnic strife, may have played a large role in sparking a five-year ethnic genocide in the southwest provinces of Matabeleland. The genocide in Matabeleland led to the deaths of thousands of civilians badly damaged Zimbabwe's international image, and nearly derailed the young nation's efforts to build a prosperous and peaceful multiracial society. The key players in this alleged scheme were former agents of the Rhodesian secret police, some of whom stayed in Zimbabwe after independence and continued to work for both South Africa and Zimbabwe's intelligence services as double agents. Despite South Africa's involvement in fanning ethnic tensions, it is worth emphasizing that responsibility for the Matabela land massacres rests primarily on the Zimbabwean government. South Africa's double agents were also involved in several sabotage attacks, including the December 1981 bomb explosion on the roof of the headquarters of ZANU-PF that killed six shoppers nearby, and the destruction in July 1982 of nearly a third of Zimbabwe's air force in a bomb attack at the Thornhill Air Base in Zimbabwe's Midlands province. On the 14th of August 1989, F.W. de Klerk took over the leadership of the South African government from P.W. Bota. De Klerk was tasked with ushering in a new dispensation in South Africa, and in a short time, he announced the removal of legislation against anti-apartheid groups including the African National Congress and the release of Nelson Mandela. With the dismantling of apartheid, South Africa's attacks on its neighbors also ended. The war in Angola came to an end in January 1990, and Namibia gained independence in the same year. South Africa held its first racially inclusive democratic elections on the 27th of April 1994, marking the end of the apartheid era and the relationship between South Africa and its neighbors improved. The SADCC later changed its name to the Southern African Development Community. 
Its goal this time was to further regional socio-economic cooperation and integration, as well as political and security cooperation among all southern African countries, including South Africa. The stories discussed in this video are just some of the examples of South Africa's extensive destabilization tactics against its neighbors, and of how it employed surrogate forces such as Renamo and UNITA to carry out some of its intimidation and sabotage. The decade-long conflict left a significant mark on politics in the region. But despite all this, apartheid South Africa's role in destabilizing its neighbors is a subject that continues to receive very little attention. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to see more videos like this one. Did you know about South Africa's covert operations in Southern Africa? Let us know in the comments. If you want to learn more about this topic, check out the video description for some links to articles and videos that were helpful in making this video.